You've got questions, we've got answers. Welcome to Common Sense on the Prairie, a podcast dedicated to helping you demystify the sometimes complex topic of money. I'm Adam Cox, Head of Wealth Management for the First National Bank, Sioux Falls. We're a community bank based out of South Dakota. In this podcast, we share expert insights from around the country and stories from our local community to arm you with the tools you need to make better financial decisions. Because the truth is, the more we talk about this stuff, the better off we're all going to be. On today's episode, we're doing something a little bit different. We're answering your questions about personal finance. Since starting this show, we've consistently received great questions on a whole range of topics. So I've compiled those questions, and we're going to walk through some of the most common ones today. To help me answer your questions, I'm joined by a certified financial planner and our wealth advisory manager, Don Ron. I hope you find our back and forth helpful, and please keep those questions coming. Don, welcome back to the pod. Thanks so much for joining me again. Yeah, thanks for having me, Adam. Glad to be back. All right, let's start with uh, some fun questions first. Okay. What kind of music are you into? Country music. That's boy. what I've went to uh, the last 15, 20 years, Adam. Um, favorite artists are Luke Combs. Oh, uh, nice. uh, Eric Church, yep. Chris Stapleton. Just went to him in concert a couple yeah. weeks ago. So. I was there too. Yeah, yeah, I didn't see you there. No. You, you said you were there. There were a few people there. Yeah, yeah. there were. Yeah, nice. All right, so... I have it on good authority that you met your wife when you were 18 years old at a keg party. So what kind of music was 18-year-old Don listening to back in 1985? Yeah, I, I let that slip to you a few weeks ago. <laughs> and maybe I shouldn't have. We're, we're here you know, live. My kids do know about it, my okay. two daughters. So yeah. I guess that's not a big deal. But we were listening to the 80s and 70s rock. Yeah. Um, you know, Boston Journey, nice. uh, 38 Special, which is probably the precursor to you know today's country music. Yeah. Nice. Mm-hmm. Very nice. Yeah. Good choice. Yeah. We had to make our own fun back then. Yeah. I grew up in rural Northwest Iowa. So, okay. you know, sure. keg parties is where it was at. Yeah. In a barn. Yeah. In a barn. Yeah. 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 Classic. It was before video games were really, yeah. you know, yeah. they were pretty, they weren't very, uh, uh, weren't very good back then. Sure. So you had to make your own fun. Yeah. I yeah. get it. I get it. <laughs> All right. So for today's episode, we're going to go through listener questions. We've gotten some really good ones over the past couple of years. And so- Great. I thought it'd be fun to tackle those on an episode. So you ready to dive in and start getting after it? Yeah, that'd be great. All right, perfect. Well, first question we've got, uh, what's the best way to tackle student loans quickly while still trying to pay for life, build up my savings, and save for retirement? Yeah. That's a doozy. It's a great question. That's a great one to start off with. Um, you know, I just watched your latest podcast release with Eric and Larissa Farendorf, yeah. your friends. Yeah. Um, I don't think I could answer it any better than that. So I would refer people to that podcast. Okay. I definitely would. But what I picked up in that podcast from Eric and Larissa is first, you you have to face it. Yeah. Um, it's there. Everybody has different levels of student debt. Yeah. Um, you know, some more more severe than others. But I think at that point, you're usually coming out of college. You're starting to make some money mm-hmm. um, in your career, and you've got to balance a lot of things. You're looking at maybe a down payment for a home. You're looking to maybe establish that first emergency reserve account yep. um, to an acceptable level that's going gonna, gonna to come through in an emergency. Um, but really just prioritizing it and making it a goal and figuring out how that fits in your budget. Um, other things I think you can consider um, is looking at the interest rates on the various student loans. Is there ways to consolidate that and get that into, you know, one large payment mm. versus a lot of little payments? Um, so there's a lot of things. But I think when I watched that podcast, that was uh, inspiring sure. um, to see how, how they how they tackled that. Yeah. And really what it came down to was discipline Yeah. Um, and really giving up some things that you want to do when you have some spending money and start making money, but you have to be disciplined to, to make that a part of your everyday budget. Sure. No, I, I, I like you. I love that episode. And that was one of the favorite ones that, we, that we've done. Um, you know, part of it too, you know, I live this, too. Mm-hmm. I had, you know, I've said it before, I had a huge amount of student loans and some of it comes down to timing too. Like mm-hmm. the amount of loans that you have, if it's a small amount, you can maybe just focus on those right away if it's a short-term thing, but if it's a big amount and you know, it's going to take years, then you have to provide a little bit more balance to yourself. And to say, well, I can't live with a tiny emergency fund forever because life happens. Right. Uh, nor can I put off saving for retirement for 10 years because those early years of saving for retirement are so important. So 
depending on how much your loans are, you may have to balance a few things. Right. I agree. And everybody's situation is different. I, I also had student debt. My wife, uh, Stephanie and I, who I met at the keg party, yeah. but I, I made up for that later in life <laughs> with her parents, but, uh, <laughs> but she didn't have student debt. Her parents put her through all the way through a master's degree in physical therapy. And I came out with an industrial engineering degree at Iowa State. And we did tackle that. It was about 22,500 hours, if I remember. Sure. It's been 31 years ago yep. when I graduated, but um, we did make that a focus and um, and uh, made that a part of our budget. But you're right. If if uh, if that's a, lot, a larger amount, um, that might have to take more years. I think yeah. we kind of treated that like a, a car payment, like we're going to try to knock this out in uh, three to five years. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Next question. When is a good time to discuss my financial situation with an advisor? Is it a certain age or after I've saved up a certain dollar amount? You know, that's another good question. I would say ideally uh, when you graduate from college and start your career or your, you know, trade school, whatever the, whatever your career is, when you've entered that career, you're done with the, you know, my first job was with Hy-Vee food sure. stores. It wasn't then, Yep. you know, just trying to make some spending money. But when I graduated from college and started my career, that's when I think it's ideally uh, a good time to meet with a financial advisor. The trouble is it's finding a financial advisor that has your best interest at heart. Yeah, totally. Um, there's a lot of things out there. I read a book um, by Charles J. Givens back in the 80s, um, kind of a Dave Ramsey type today okay. of those kinds of things that I think set me on the right track. I wanted to be, um, you know, uh, intentional with my finances. But I would say right when you're out of, you know, when you start your career and you start to make money, that's the ideal time to to start working with a financial advisor. And sure. that's what I love about our program here. Uh, we have a foundational planning uh, software that we go through with clients. They do not have to have that magic $500,000 mark yep. where many advisors before they start working with you. And we have some one-page tools to help people get started on the right track. Yeah. The trouble with um, the advisory world is usually the people who are willing to work with young professionals are looking to sell them high cost insurance products. Right. I mean, when you really boil it down to, because there's not a lot of investable assets. So that's how the advisor is going to make money is by selling those products. So we've created something a little bit different we think is, is a good model. And so good advisors are out there. Um, it's really going to take those young professionals to look to find an advisor that has their best interest at heart uh, versus just going with a buddy from college who's now selling insurance. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what I would say is just, you know, uh, take the time to find, ask your parents. Mm -hmm. They may have their advisor. Many yep. times um, advisors will take on, they like that legacy aspect of, you know, not only working with you, but working with your children. So that's maybe a good place to start where you're going to get um, some good advice. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right. This next one's one we hear quite a bit, and it's a very personal and uh, kind of sometimes emotional question. Uh, I funded my own college education, and now that I'm a parent, I have mixed feelings about paying for my kids' college. How important is it to save for our children's college? Yeah. So that's a doozy too. Yeah, that is. And I smile because uh, it's a tough question because it you can come at it from a financial or a finance angle, you know, save how much is it going to cost and do some factors uh, in that that realm. But it really is how important of a goal is it for you? But the thing um, I would say is that you do not want the saving for kids, kids, kids education to come in front of saving for your retirement. Yeah. Uh, having the adequate emergency fund. Some of these eight steps that we have in our one pager mm -hmm. that we share with our clients is that you want to have those things down and on the right track before you start worrying about saving for college. Then it comes down to means. Do you have the means? Like I said, I had student debt. My parents were great people. They just didn't have the means to pay for my college. Yeah. So I had the Pell Grant. I had the, the student loans and the guaranteed student loans and so forth. My wife's parents, um, they, they were in a position to pay for her college, like I said. So then it comes down to a goal. It's more of an emotional thing. Um, you know, everybody sees that different ways. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that, when I'm working with clients, is just trying to get to the bottom of that. How important is it to them? Do they want to do that? Do they not? Do they want their children to have loans like they did? 
and figure that out first. But if they do want to provide for that or part of that education, then I'm steering them towards uh, products like the 529 plan. Um, that's a great tool to save for college. You yeah. get tax-free growth. And as long as it's used for educational purposes, it's take it, the distributions to pay for education are tax-free. Yeah. Well, it's like what you hear on an airplane, you know, put on your own oxygen mask before helping others. Yeah. So sometimes parents, it's a very emotional decision. Maybe they had student loans or their parents paid for their college. And so they want to do the same thing, or they don't want their kids to be saddled with a bunch of student loans, but they put that in front of their own uh, you know, financial future, which right. is a mistake. You know, I always say there's no scholarships for retirement. Right. Like there are lots of different ways to pay for college. There's not a lot of different ways to pay for retirement. So it's really, really critical that you have your own house in order before you try to save for kids' as college. That's exactly right. I, and that's what I, I would agree that it, retirement, do not sacrifice your retirement for paying for your children's education. Sure. Live in their basement later if you want to, not because you have to. Yeah, right? there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Next question, college related. When I was in college 15 years ago, my professors always said to save 15% of your salary into your retirement account. That has been my benchmark. Now I'm hearing we should shoot for 20%. Do you expect that recommendation to continue to keep rising? So first I would say the professors 15 years ago were ahead of their time. As for the longest time, people have said, save 10%. For your retirement, but that was before accounting for rising healthcare costs, longer living, and uh, lack of pensions. So, right, right, good job, kudos to the professors for for being fifteen percent. So, what do you think? Do you think that percentage is going to continue to uh, increase? Um, it could. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know how much more it can. You know, can go up than yeah. than twenty percent. And I and I look at that. I think you nailed it. With the, you know, when the 10% rules being said, and these are rules of thumb, right? Yeah. Um, but that was when pensions were, were predominant mm -hmm. in the 50s and 60s. Uh, even if a person worked for a private company, they had a pension. Yeah. Um, now that's mostly in the government sector where people have a pension. So it's really transitioned since the 70s really into the 401k and the 403bs, the company match where you take control of your own retirement. And with that be comes more responsibility, hence putting more percentage of your salary away. Sure. And I think I've thought about this question. We talked about this a week ago mm -hmm. as we were kind of preparing. And uh, I, I think it is a factor of what what is your household income? Mm. I think the higher the household income, the more likely you are to hit that 20% benchmark. Yeah. And you might not hit that right out of, you know, your first, you know, your first job out of college or your first trade, you're not going to be able to hit that because you're balancing all these other priorities. But um, the lower the income, probably the harder that is, because if you think of just putting food and uh, clothing and shelter and transportation to and from work, that's a bigger percentage of a lower person's budget that's kind yep. of a fixed cost. Yeah. Um, so I think 20% is a good benchmark for higher uh, income earning households. Um, and the thing I like rather than rules of thumb, being an engineer and being a financial planner is I love going through the financial planning process with clients rather than just stating these percentages, you know, state a goal, uh, plug it into the software, make some assumptions that are reasonable, educated guesses. There's nothing perfect about financial planning. I'm the first to tell clients that, but at the same token, track that goal and see what your current savings, whether it be 15 or 20% or 10%, how does that look in relation to your goal in today's dollars that you need to live on? And sure. our software does a great job tracking that for yeah. our clients. Well, I think it's important for young people in particular to hear this and they think they're coming out of their first job. Maybe they got the student loans, they're paying rent, the, you know, the cost of everything continues to keep rising. Um, and they think 20%, like, are you kidding me? Right. Well, that doesn't mean, you know, you mentioned this, that doesn't mean that's where you start. Right. But, you know, you can ratchet that up a percent or two every year as you get those pay increases. You're not going to notice that extra money that's going towards your retirement. Right. That's not going to feel like it's missing because right. you just put that in as part of your raise every year. And so you work your way up to it. Right. Unfortunately, what we see is a lot of time people hit that savings benchmark 
sometimes when maybe it's a little bit too late, mm-hmm. like they get in their fifties and that's when they get serious about saving for retirement. Right. And then they get up to that 15%. But by that time they hadn't been saving nearly enough uh, all those years and it could be really hard to catch up. Right. Right. Exactly. And we even did a, uh, a case study on that last year that we shared with mm-hmm. our clients that um, just showed incrementally, you know, starting with say 5% and, and just keeping it at 5% versus inching that up by 1% a year yep. for the next 15 years to get to that 20%. And it's dramatically different, uh, the dollars that you can accumulate with a with a, even a 5% return yeah, on sure, your investment. Sure is. Okay, next question. Love this one. Should I pay off my home early? Yeah, I think that's something that's, um, I think you want to make sure you have your other goals uh, tracked, just mm-hmm. like the college savings that we just talked about, that before you start paying off your home early, um, you want to make sure that your retirement goal is on track. Mm-hmm. Um, because that, that the years of compounding in a retirement account, you know, that can't be made up for when you turn to be 50, 55. Yep. You know, when you get to my age, you really want to be putting that in in your, your, your 20s and 30s to allow that compounding to happen and, mm-hmm. and the power of compounding. So I think if you're on track on the other goals, assuming that, I think it's it's a great goal to have. I usually tell clients um, or advise clients that you want to have your mortgage paid off by the time you are retired for sure. Yeah. And so I think you're talking about earlier than that. Mm-hmm. And I think um, as long as you've met all the other things, high interest debt is paid off, car loans are paid off, um, usually home mortgages are your lowest interest rate. I think you can still get one you know, a conventional mortgage um, for under 3% on a 30-year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's usually your lower percent, but I think it's a great goal to have. Um, but maybe look at maxing 401ks first, maxing your 403b first, uh, maxing Roth IRAs if you're in the income bracket to allow you to, to max Roth IRAs yeah, sure. first. But then I think that's a great goal to look at because it's just going to put you in position that you've paid it off earlier and you're in better position those later years of retirement to keep um, putting money away. Yeah, you free up that cash flow. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So maybe the moral of the story is if you're meeting all of the the big benchmarks for saving for retirement and for your future, and then you still have extra money, right? And you want that to be a goal to be debt free, go ahead and plow that money into the mortgage. Right. Right. I always tell people the the mortgage, you know, the interest if you're paying around 3%, 2.5%, whatever it is, um, you're going to have to take a little risk uh, for that to pan out. It's called yep. leveraging. Yep. Um, but it typically does work out. Historically, mm-hmm. it has. You're typically, if you put, um, you know, 60, 70% in, into a stock exposure, you're going to outpace that mortgage yep. over time. Not every year, but over time you are. Yeah, makes sense. Mm-hmm. All right. How often should I rebalance my 401k? You know, I think... I would say um, not too often. Mm -hmm. Um, You're better off uh, maybe setting it and forgetting it a little bit and not trying to get uh, uh, too cute with trying to time things in the market and that type of thing. But I would say once a year, um, you should be taking a look at it. You should look at your statements, but at least once a year um, to see how things are doing. Um, But even today with most 401k plans, they have these what are called target date retirement funds is an option. And they're a great option for the, the, the novice investor. Mm-hmm. You do not have to be an expert to pick which asset classes should I be in large cap, you know, growth, large cap value, mm-hmm. mid cap, small cap, international emerging markets. You basically um, pick a target date fund. So you basically take um, the year in which you think you're going to retire at 60, 65, say, and pick that 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 date, and yeah. that's automatically rebalanced for you as you go through. Um, as each year, it's rebalanced as you put your uh, contributions in, and it's also dialed back on the risk exposure as you get closer to retirement. Sure. Well, studies continue to show that people who are more active with their portfolios tend to underperform those that just set it up once and then forgot about it. Not right. that we're saying that's a good thing to do, Right. But it does show that people who are in it for the long term and pick one good investment to begin with generally outperform those who are constantly trying to tinker and time time the market. Right. I agree with that. And that's why I think once a year is a decent middle of the road approach. Yeah. Yeah. You're not you're not reacting to every market news cycle. Sure. If you're doing it once a year. 
Well, speaking of target dates, the next question is related to that. How should I position my portfolio as I get closer to retirement? No, so I think generally the 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 uh, the philosophy on that was you have to dial back risk as you get closer to retirement. Mm-hmm. There's a thing called uh, sequencing risk. So when you retire, and what that means is when you retire, if the market has a major correction in your first year or two of retirement, that can be devastating on your portfolio, especially if you're 90 to 100 percent in stocks. Mm-hmm. You, you probably just don't want to be there. So I would say, and this is really um, the wheelhouse that I work in with a lot of clients, people that are about 50 to 65 that are just getting close to retirement, getting serious about it, or maybe very early into retirement. And it's just having enough in the bonds and cash space so that if there's a market correction, that you have very safe assets to rely on to meet your distribution needs and meet your lifestyle needs that you do not have to sell stocks in a downturn if you have enough, say, in the bonds and, and cash position of your portfolio. Sure. How much of a cash cushion would you recommend? Sorry, now I'm answering. I'm, I'm putting in my own questions now. Mm-hmm. Sorry, That's I'm okay. going off script. How much would you recommend for clients to have in cash as they get closer to retirement? Yeah. So I, I would say the first, at least look a year out for distributions and have that part in cash sure. for sure. Yep. Um, if you're in a position um, and you don't, and you can dial back the risk, um, you might have even two years yep. in that that bucket. Um, just because you don't, markets can react quickly. Mm. Um, even in the bond market, um, when interest rates rise, bond mutual funds can go down in value too. So one to two years, I think, is the the target mark uh, for having that just waiting. You know you're not earning much with it in today's environment, but you know it's going to be there when you need it. Yeah. And um, what we like to do with our clients is do what are called tactical distributions. We, we, we're very humbled to know that we cannot predict what the stock market's going to do. Um, COVID, uh, you know, uh, just showed us that in 2020, how sure. quickly things can go down, but then things can quickly come back up. But you just don't want to be a, in a position where you have to sell stocks to meet lifestyle expenses mm-hmm. um, in a downturn. And that's where that cash cushion comes in. That's where that cash cushion comes in. You can rely on that. If things are doing really well in the market, you may just keep that cash cushion there for two years. And if things, you've had a 20% uptick, you might shave some off the stocks. And that's what we call a tactical distribution strategy. Sure. You're not trying to time the market. You're you're just taking what has the market just recently given you Yep. and making a distribution based on that. Sure. And clients, when we explain that philosophy, it really seems to a strike a chord and it just kind of makes intuitive sense to them. Speaking of cash, this maybe is a question we get the most often. What should I do with extra cash today? Yeah. Um, I think again, if you've hit all those goals that we've talked about, I think, um, you know, first max the 401k, if you have extra cash, um, we've even had people that are near retirement. It, it comes as a surprise to them, but they have extra cash, on the sidelines, and we've asked them to just max out the 401k and hardly even have a paycheck. Mm. And that's kind of a hard concept for people because they're used to getting a paycheck. But yeah. We show them the tax savings that they can do that just as kind of like one last tax savings strategy right before retirement, live off your, your savings mm. account. Um, but if you if all those goals are met and you've maxed your 401ks, debt's all paid down, then I would say an investment agency account makes a lot of sense. Um, especially when you're um, well before 60 and you have extra cash, an investment agency account is so flexible. And that's, when I say investment agency account, that's the type of account we have in a fiduciary, you know, trust investment division sure. like we have. Um, that The equivalent would be a brokerage account, mm-hmm. you know, in the brokerage world. But there you don't have these rules about 59 and a half and taking distributions. It's very flexible, and that's a great place to stash away cash. And um, you should have a, a time horizon of maybe five years if you're going to go into an account like that, especially if you're going to own stocks. Um, but it's very flexible when you take money out. Hopefully, you're paying capital gains. Yeah, yeah. That means the account went up, Mm -hmm. right? That's exactly right. Yeah. Well, I think the other thing too is clients assume that there's a silver bullet 
uh, with cash and a different way to mm-hmm. get return without any risk. And there's really none. And so what I always encourage folks to think about with their cash and their cash reserves is to not get cute with it. Right. It's just there for safety and it's there if you need it. You don't yep. want to lock it up in any way. You don't want it to be subject to market risk. You want it to be available and to be stable. And so cash is cash and you just have to hold your nose on interest rates sometimes. And we're in one of those periods right now. That's right. I agree with you totally on that, Adam. It's just don't reach for yield. Yeah. Um, that's when you can get burned. Yeah, exactly. You know, reaching for yield. Well, all right. Those were our questions today. Uh, so if there are questions that our listeners um, have that they, maybe we didn't touch on today, uh, or maybe they just want to talk about their own personal situation, I assume you'd welcome the opportunity for you and your team to talk with uh, talk with our listeners? Absolutely, Adam. Um, that's how most of our meetings start with, a, with um, our prospective clients is we just have a meeting and get to know each other. And that's really the first step in the, the financial planning process. Um, answer questions that they're thinking about and how can we address those questions and put together a plan to, to address those questions. Perfect. Thanks so much for joining me today, Don. Thank you, Adam. All Appreciate right. it. I hope you found this helpful. If you did, please subscribe and share with your family or friends. If you have a topic you want us to cover in future episodes, send us a note through our website. And if you're at the point where you want an expert opinion on your finances, reach out and we'd be happy to start a conversation. And remember, any comments, insights, or strategies discussed on this podcast are intended to be general in nature and therefore may not be suitable for you and your situation, whatever that may be. Before acting on anything we discuss, please consult with your attorney, CPA, and or your financial advisor.